a little bit of a word of warning, a little bit of grace. I did not write a sermon this week. Um, I, I sat on the beach under an umbrella and talked to my wife and listened to uh, books on tape. Or I say books on tape like an elderly person. Um, <laughs> I listen to Audible books and my AirPods Pro in my ears. So, um, and um, it was just so relaxing and so refreshing. So I actually wrote this message at like last night o'clock. It's a little bit of a workshop, if you will. Uh, so uh, if you'll give a little bit of grace uh, for the guy that didn't super prepare for this message, I'm just going to be shooting from the hip. Uh, in addition to listening to books on tape, um, I was listening to the Bible, and I'm in like three different parts of the Bible right now, um, but, uh, or I was in two different parts of the Bible, but I was just like, you know what, I haven't read Genesis in a while. So um, I, I pulled up Genesis on my phone and put my AirPods in, and I just listened to Genesis, the book of Genesis, and I was... I was taken aback, especially when you're listening to it with, without like, I'm not writing a sermon, I'm just listening to it because it's the word of God and I want it to feed my soul. I was taken aback by God's blessing over everybody in the book of Genesis if they obeyed him. Like, here's Adam and Eve. Adam, you know, the whole earth is yours. You're rich. It's all, you're the landowner of the world. You know, he was like, he created this guy and Adam... Through very minimal obedience, he was given everything. And then Abraham, back when he was Abram, he's like, Abe, I want you to leave this place, go to this place, and if you'll obey me in that, I will make you rich and bless you. And all throughout the Old Testament, that's sort of how we see the hand of God's blessing is through prosperity and through abundance. And it kind of just made me zoom out and go, man, our God is the God of like extreme abundance. Like, he doesn't do anything like little. He, he, everything he does is just, he's the God of more than enough. Like, how many stars do we really need in the sky? You know, like, and, and even for navigators back in the old days before GPS on the ships on the ocean, how many stars actually needed to be visible for them to navigate their ships at night? Like, how deep does the ocean, like, how deep does the Mariana Trench need to actually be for us to have enough water, like Josie was saying? Like, how big does the sky actually have to be for us to have air to breathe. Like, it's like everything God does is just extra. God be extra. And I, to me, he's like a dad who's always trying to spoil his favorite kid. And you know how you're God's favorite kid? So say that. Say, I'm God's favorite kid. Oh, well, some of y'all need a lesson in your identity in Christ if that was hard for you to say. You are God's favorite kid. And it's like he's a loving father that wants to just spoil you rotten. But so many people have had terrible fathers or absentee fathers or, or, or their fathers passed away or their fathers were abusive or like we've had this real negative impression of a father that we struggle to see God as a loving father that is extreme in his abundance in every area of our life. Now the problem is every time I mention you know abundance and, and prosperity our minds our, especially our American minds it goes to money but when God prospers like money is the least important thing that he wants to prosper us with but it's the thing that we focus on God is like I want to prosper you with health I want to prosper you with safety I want to prosper you with joy I want to prosper you with peace with protection with faith with rest with hope with wisdom with compassion with mercy with holiness I want to prosper you in every area of your life and oh yeah by the way since you make such a big deal out of it I'll prosper you financially as well but we need to look for the blessing and the extreme abundance of God in every area of our life, but often we struggle to see God as a loving father that wants to be generous and be abundant to prosper us in every area of our life. I want you to repeat this after me and see if you have a hard time saying it. Repeat this. Say, I believe, I believe that God is my loving father, God is my loving father. and that he wants to prosper me with extreme abundance. Did you struggle? Like, did some of you, some of you who, who know who you are in Christ and know that God is a loving father, you're like, amen, yes. But some of you are like, yeah, not so much. It's hard, right? Like, we do struggle sometimes to understand and picture God as a loving father that's trying to spoil us and prosper us in every area of our life. So when I was studying this out, I thought of five things that unlock the, the heart of the Father and, and the kingdom of abundance, this extreme abundance, I found five things. But before we get into these five things, when we talk about finances, when we talk about blessing, when we talk about money, sometimes in the church, we end up in two ditches. And we're way over here in this ditch, and it says, prosperity and financial wealth is the mark of great spirituality. But then there's this ditch over here in the church, too, that says, poverty is a sign of great spirituality. Neither one are true. 
because you can be extremely wealthy and have hatred for God and still be wealthy. It's not necessarily a sign of God's blessing. And you can be extremely poor, but it does not mean that you're any more spiritual than anyone else in the middle. And you take Abraham, for example, back in the book of Genesis. God made him rich simply because he obeyed God. He said, Abe, I want you to move from here to here. And Abe was like, okay. And he packed up his family and started moving. So God blessed him. So really, it was an, Abraham put his faith in God, which leads to my first point, and that it is faith that settles the lordship of who God is in our life. I wish it was the old days, and I wish Danielle Carrico wasn't in our church, and I could use the whiteboard. But since Danny's a part of our church, I'm not allowed to use the whiteboard anymore. Please tell me they're bringing it out behind me. Is that, okay, good. Thanks, guys. One time in staff meeting, Danielle goes, I don't really get the whiteboard. You are a terrible artist. Your handwriting is illegible, but you think it helps people to follow along. Yes, I do, Danny. Just because you have perfect handwriting, it looks like a font. Five things that, in my opinion, unlock extreme blessing and favor, and the first one we've already talked about is the lordship issue. What do I mean by the lordship issue? And that is when we embrace Jesus as Lord, we are embracing what he says more than what we think. We are embracing what Jesus says more than what the world thinks. We are embracing what Jesus says more than what politics say, more than what celebrities say. We are, we are establishing the lordship of Jesus in our mind, in our hearts, and in our lives. And if Jesus is not lord over everything in our life, he's lord over nothing in our life. So we have to surrender everything to the lordship of Jesus. And we have to embrace that Jesus is lord over our minds, lord over our workplace, lord over our marriages, lord over our children, lord over our homes, lord Lord over our hobbies. Oh, and by the way, Lord over our finances. And that when we say that God is a loving father that wants to be extreme in prospering us, we need to believe it and not doubt it. We need to be able to confess that statement we said earlier that my God is a loving father that wants to bless and prosper me with extreme generosity. It's an issue of lordship. It's an issue of faith. Go back to Matthew chapter 19. Jesus is in the height of his ministry. Thousands of people are coming to him, but there's this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what do I need to do to receive eternal life? And Jesus looked at him and he said, it's simple. In Matthew chapter 19, he said, you don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't testify falsely, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. And the rich young ruler is like, bet, I do all that. What else? And Jesus said, oh, well, if you want to be perfect, go sell all of your possessions and give your money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven, and then you can come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had many possessions. See, the rich young ruler had not settled the lordship issue. Jesus was not, was not yet lord over his heart, so therefore Jesus was not yet lord over his money. Now, a little side note, people, people that want to be in the poverty ditch, that, that you have to be poor to be a follower of Jesus, they want to use this portion of scripture. But that's wrong, because just literally a few verses later, at the bottom of Matthew chapter 19, Jesus said, if you give up family, if you give up stuff, if you give up wealth, I'm going to give you in this life 100 times what you gave up. And that's just a few verses later. And he's, he's talking about family. He's also talking about wealth. He says, I'm going to bless you so much. I'm gonna, you know that thing that's going to kill you? I'm going to give you 100 times of it if you'll give it up for me. And then later, just a few chapters later, in Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, the final instructions that Jesus gives to the disciples in Matthew chapter 28, he says, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. Go disciple nations. You can't disciple nations if you have a poverty mentality. You can't disciple nations if you think that God is not extreme in his desire to bless you with abundance. You can't disciple nations if you can't break off poverty from the way you think. You can't disciple nations if you can't afford a plane ticket. You have to realize that we're kingdom royalty. 
And it's from that place of authority that we disciple the nations. It's a lordship issue. And because Jesus is Lord of our hearts, he's king of kings, and our faith is in him, we have settled the lordship issue. Back to the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler had not yet settled the lordship issue, so Jesus was not yet lord of his money, so therefore Jesus tested him in that very area to examine his heart. But I remind you of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus gave his heart to Jesus, put his faith in Jesus, settled the lordship issue, and Zacchaeus had a a, a, a vast empire of money that he stole from people. He was very wealthy, but Jesus did not tell Zacchaeus to sell everything and give it all to the poor. Isn't that interesting? So Zacchaeus is following along behind the Lord, and he's like, hey, Jesus, because I've settled the lordship issue, I'm going to give away half of all of my wealth to the poor, but only half. And then they're walking along. And he's like, Jesus, I've cheated people to get rich. I'm going to go back and look at my records, and I'm going to pay back four times what I stole from people to get rich. But Jesus never said, you need to get rid of everything to Zacchaeus. He was saying, Zach, you can still be rich and follow me. See, the key to this kind of level of prosperity in every area of our life is not a formula. See, some people want to break out a calculator and a slide rule and a spreadsheet and go, boop, 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 boop. If I push this button and pull that lever and divide by pi, I'm going to be rich in Jesus' name. That's not how it works. It's always going to be an issue of lordship. It's never going to be a formula for you to complete. It is our faith in God to prosper our heart, to prosper our life, to prosper our health, to prosper our marriage, to prosper our kids. It's our faith in the lordship of Jesus, not in our wealth. We're not putting our faith in our 401k. We're not putting our faith alone in our doctor. We're not putting our faith alone in our ability to work. We're not putting our faith alone in a political system. Our faith is in Jesus no matter what happens. He is, he is, it's the very first and most important key that this will unlock the heart of God the Father to provide, but there is a second one that overlaps with the first one, and that is generosity. And generosity we, we find in two forms. The, the first would be obedience. He asks us to tithe, to take the first tenth, tithe means tenth, take the first 10% of our income and give it to the Lord. So the first aspect of, of generosity is simply obedience, but <laughs> it's actually connected to the lordship issue. Because if all the people that I know that tithe, it's because they have settled the lordship issue. Jesus is Lord over my life. He's Lord over my money. He's Lord over the first 10%. So of course, I'm going to give it to him. So tithing, it simply shows our obedience, which will unshackle God's hands. What do you mean God's hands are shackled by my disobedience? Malachi chapter um, 3 and verse 10 says, if you tithe... I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great you won't even have enough room to take it all in. Just try me. Like, put me to the test. If, he's saying, if you'll be obedient with the tithe, I will open the windows of heaven and I'm going to give you more than you can handle, more than you need. More, I'm going to bless you. But if you don't tithe, you are the one who's holding back God's blessing in your life. I've said it this way. If you don't tithe, you will end up paying 10%, but you're not going to give it to the Lord. You're going to give it to the tax man. You're going to give it to the, to the tire shop from blowing out tires. You're going to give it to having to have buy new shoes. But if you will tithe, your trust, God will take care of you, and the, the, the sandals and your feet won't wear out because he's wanting to bless you. But here's the other thing. When you give, and let's say tithe, don't look for the Lord to just bless you financially. When you give in tithing, say, ask, Lord, bless me and my, bless my wife and bless my kids and, and bless my, my workplace and, and, and bless my faith and bless my church and bless my city. Look for the Lord to respond and open the windows of heaven over every area of your life. And then I want to remind you of something we talked about in January of this year. Generosity is the second aspect of this, not obedience to tithe, but generosity. And generosity starts at 11%. See, tithe is just not stealing from God. Generosity starts when we give over and above. And I don't want you to think, Uncommon Church is the most generous church I've ever been involved with. And I've worked with many churches over the years. You guys are the most generous people. If, if we brought in a, a need, you know, hey, there's a, a missionary in Iraqistan and they need $20,000 by today, this room would raise $20,000 over and above tithe. Why? Because you're a generous people. So I, 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 I celebrate your generosity, but I also want to point out that it is a key to unlocking God's blessing in your life. Remember, though, Paul gave instructions to the church in Corinth how to give. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he said, listen, remember this. A farmer that plants only a few seeds is going to get a small crop. 
but one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly, but also don't give in response to pressure because God loves a person who gives cheerfully. But then look at verse eight, and this is where I wanna hang out for a minute. God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Like if you're not dancing in the aisles right now, then you didn't read verse eight. Let me read it to you one more time. God will generously provide all you need then you will always have everything you need, and then you'll have plenty left. Generously, all, always, everything, plenty. It's dripping with extreme abundance, but it's triggered by our generosity. In fact, I, I looked it up in the Greek because I, I, I nerded out on this. I saw a footnote in my Bible, and then I had to go online and, and do all the clicky clicks. In verse eight, that, that, that phrase in English, everything you need, is actually a single Greek word, and it means that you would have everything, that you will lack nothing. But 300 years earlier, Aristotle used this in Greek writing. That same word means independently wealthy. It's possible that in 300 years from Aristotle to Paul, the meaning of the word in Greek did change, and it no longer meant um, independently wealthy, but I think that it probably did. So let's read verse eight one more time. And he said, if you will give generously, verse seven says, you will, uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Verse eight says, God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will be independently wealthy and have plenty left over to share with others. That's extreme abundance to have more than you need. That's, that's a, a loving father that wants to give extreme abundance and spoil his kids. Number three. Identity. How am I going to do this? Because I don't have time to write it all in. I'm just going to do identity. What did I write in there? Living from a place of royalty. You're not an orphan. You're a child of the Most High God. You have access to the King of Kings refrigerator. Too many people have been raised by their family, by their parents and grandparents with the mentality and the mindset and sometimes even the curse of poverty. We are the ones that need to break that spirit of poverty over our lives. We put our foot down and say, no, no more. I know my parents, my grandparents, my, sis, my siblings, my aunts, my uncles have all struggled uh, with poverty, but I'm not gonna do that because I know who I am in Christ. I know that I am a child of the most high God and God ain't broke. So I'm gonna get out of debt I'm not gonna have credit card debt. One day I'll own my own home. I'm gonna save for retirement. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a vacation and pay cash for it and not put it on a credit card. I'm gonna prepare an inheritance for my kids and my grandkids. I'm gonna live a rich and satisfying life because John 10, Jesus said, the thief's purpose, the devil's purpose, is to steal and to kill and to destroy. But my purpose, the Lord said, is to give you a rich and satisfying life. The devil is always trying to kill, steal, and to destroy from you, from your heart, from your marriage, from your kids, from your peace, from your joy, from your freedom, and from your finances. But God is always working on your behalf to give you a rich and satisfying life. Again, there's a footnote in my Bible. I geeked out. I went out and looked at the Greek. That that, that phrase, rich and satisfying, it, it literally means more than you expected. More than you could expect is what rich and satisfying means. Those of you that know my story and my mom who's probably watching online right now, I apologize for what I'm about to say, but suck it up. (laughs) I am the product between my mom, my dad, my stepmom, and my stepdad. I am a product of 11 marriages. I never expected when Josie and I got married almost 25 years ago that 25 years later, my marriage would be amazing and be this much fun. I didn't know that being married to someone could, it it was more than I expected. But that's the blessing of God. I have, you know, my sister, my half-sister, my half-brother, another half-sister, and I don't know how many steps. Oh, I know, but it's a lot. I think I know. My point is, I have three kids of my own now. And I I never expected raising three kids to serve the Lord and to know the Lord would be this much fun. It, It was more than I expected. 
I never wanted to be a pastor. I always wanted to be a missionary and, and just continue to travel the world and preach the gospel in nations all around the world. But 15 years ago, the Lord called us to be associate pastors. And then almost 11 years ago, the Lord called us to be the lead pastors here at this church. I had no idea what I was missing out on and the rich and satisfying life that there is in serving in this city and serving in this church. But you know what? Years ago, I embraced my identity, not as an orphan, but as a son of the most high God. So I've embraced that identity. Therefore, my father has prospered me in every area of my life. Why? Because I know who I am in Christ and I know my identity in him, which leads to the next one, number four. There's five total. And there, circle. <laughs> Obedience. Shut up, Danny. Look at her, she's literally covering her face because I'm such a bad writer. -er. Do what God asks you to do, and oh, by the way, stop doing what he's asked you to, to not do anymore. Yeah. Obedience plays a hand in how God blesses us. And I told you, that's what I read in Genesis chapter 12 this week. It was when the Lord said to Abram, hey, Abe, leave your native country, leave your relatives, leave your father's family, go to the land that I'll show you, and then I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you, and I will make you famous and you will be a blessing to others all around the world, which in a way goes back to the lordship issue. The Lord spoke to Abram. This is the first time we hear about a person like having a conversation with God in this kind of way that there's gonna be obedience and then blessing. If you obey me, I'm gonna bless you. So our job, our response is to put ourselves obediently into the lane that God is, is causing us to run in and run the race that he has set before you. Now, your lane is different from your neighbor's lane. What you do for a living and how much money you make and how you raise your family is different. It's, it's not uniform. It, it's, it's not a cult. I know sometimes uncommon feels like a cult, but it's not a cult. Everybody has their own lane to run in, so you are simply responsible to be obedient to what God has called you to do. And that's what, so obey God, but also don't do the things he's asked you not to do. God made Adam and Eve rich. He said, I'm gonna give you everything. Just don't do this one thing. What did they do? The one thing. What did God do? Kick them out of the garden. So when I say you need to be obedient to the things he's called you to do. You also need to stop sinning. Stop getting drunk. Stop getting high. Stop looking at pornography. Stop sleeping with somebody you're not married to. Stop stealing from your work. Stop getting angry. Stop sinning. Why? Because we have to obey, but we also have to stop doing the things he's asked us not to do. Why? Because when we sin willingly against God, it closes the windows of heaven. How are we doing on time? Eight minutes. Number five. Here we go. Let's get it. It's got to cover this and come down like that. That's a circle. <laughs> Stewardship. Somebody said something funny over here, but you weren't loud enough to say it so I could hear it. So you ain't that funny. <laughs> Be content. Be content with what you've got. That you're not longing for somebody else's wealth, you're longing for more of his presence. Amen. That's a key, is that we live from a place of peace, not anxiety. I'm not saying you don't hope for more. I'm not saying that you don't have a dream to earn more money, to be more of a blessing, to save more for your kids, to give more to others. I'm not, I'm not saying there's not, you don't have a dream in your heart. I'm saying that you're not anxious about it, that you're not pushing God for more in the flesh, that you're content with what God has given you. So I'll take you back to Matthew chapter 19 about the rich young ruler. And then Jesus goes on to say, um, oh, this is a long story. I, I left it out of my notes because it was going to take too long. But he was talking to the disciples and he said, unless you give up everything, the rich are going to really struggle to know me. And Peter responded, well, then Lord, who can be saved? So Peter, who was a fisherman and was married, might have had kids, but had a career, and he gave it up to follow the Lord. Peter saw himself as a wealthy person. So, because Jesus said, you can't follow me unless you give it all up. But then at the end, he says, listen, Pete, you're saved. You 12 guys, because you've given up everything, I'm gonna set you on 12 thrones at the end of time. That was specifically for the 12 disciples. But then the very next verse, he says, everyone who has given up 
anything for me, family, mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, I'm gonna give it back to you a hundredfold and I'm gonna give you eternal life, which is the, what we're all in this for together. But then he says, guys, the first will be last, the last will be first. But when Jesus was speaking, he didn't have chapter breaks. Like Jesus didn't go, the first will be last, the last will be first. Whoever's writing that down, put a chapter break there. No, Matthew chapter 20 and verse one begins Jesus' next thought, which was the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And he said, there's a landowner that's got some, uh, a vineyard that's got to get harvested. So he went and hired some people. Now, by the way, those of you that are Bible scholars, and you're going to send me an email this week and say, um, actually, Matthew chapter 20's story of the landowner hiring the people to work in the vineyard is more so to do with the ancient Jews and then them accepting the fact that there were going to be Samaritans and Gentiles that come to fit. I know that. I went to Bible college too. But whenever God speaks, I think he speaks on multiple levels. And I think there's more to learn there than just the, the, the obvious truth. Some of you were like, that was the obvious truth. The obvious truth <laughs> about the Jews and the Gentiles. So let's look at Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to read 16 verses very quickly. But listen to the story. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner that went out early in the morning to hire some workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for a day, and then he sent them out into the vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out. He saw some other people standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He said, hey, you want to go work in my vineyard? I'll give you whatever's right. He didn't tell them they were going to work for a denarius. So they agreed. They went. And then he went out again at noon. And then he went out again about three o'clock in the afternoon. And he did the same thing. And at about five o'clock in the afternoon, he went out. He found others that were still standing around. He said, why, haven't you, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Uh, because nobody has hired us. He said, well, go work in my vineyard. So then evening came. The owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call all of the workers and then pay them their wages. Beginning with the last ones, the one that were just hired, they're going to be first. So the workers all gathered together and the one that were hired at five o'clock in the afternoon, they came and they received a denarius. And remember, that was the price that the guys at 6 a.m. agreed to work for. Verse 10. So when they came to those that were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. They said, hey, these were hired an hour ago, and you made them equal to us because they have borne the burden of the work that we have done all day long in the heat of the day. But he answered to them, listen, I'm not being unfair to you, my friends. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? That's what I gave you. Take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want to do with my own money? Or are you being envious? The Greek says, are you having an evil eye because I'm being generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. I read it really quickly, but if you missed it, the landowner, let's say it was a, a 10, 12 hour work day. Let's say it was 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And he went out and said, hey, you guys want to work in my vineyard? I'll give you a denarius. A denarius was a silver Roman coin. Its value was one hard day's labor for a low-income employee. In today's economy, let's say it was $100 for a 12-hour workday. Basically minimum wage, right? But they agreed to it. And then he went out at 9 a.m., and then he went out at noon, and then he went out at 5, and he gathered all these other workers. So the guys that worked at noon, they only worked six hours. And of course, the guy that got hired at 5 only worked one hour. But did you notice that the landowner, and this is Jesus' parable, the landowner paid the guys last first, and he was extremely generous to them. He basically gave them $100 for one hour of work. Here's the deal. If he would have paid the all-day workers, the 6 a.m. workers, the ones that had agreed to work for a denarius, if he would have paid them first, they would have thought the landowner gave them a fair wage, what was agreed upon. But instead, he makes them watch as he gives extreme generosity to the people that worked for much less time. So obviously, the people that had been there for 10, 12 hours, they were like 100, 200, 300. Dude, we're getting at least 1,000 bucks. Like, so they're over here elbowing each other like, hey, he gave the one-hour guys a denarius. We're going to get 10, 12 denariuses. We're going we're gonna to get 1,000 bucks out of this day. Why? It was literally a test Jesus was pushing the jealousy button in their hearts. And the, the, the same goes for us today. If we receive 
justice, but somebody else receives extreme blessing, can we celebrate that they were blessed? Or are we ungrateful for what we have and we're longing for more? Because in wages, in life, God will always give you the bare minimum, but some people he will give extreme provision to. You will always have the bare minimum. Sometimes you'll have the maximum. But here's the warning. He will bless people with abundance in your life because he wants you to watch them get blessed. And if we are truly grateful to God for his justice, the bare minimum, and we're truly grateful to God for his extreme provision for other people, then he knows he can trust us with more. It really, stewardship, goes back to the lordship issue. But here in the middle, when all of these things, when the lordship and generosity and our identity and our obedience and our stewardship come together, this is the place of extreme blessing, of extreme prosperity. Because this is the place where God knows he can trust us with more. The longer I do this, I have seen people become wealthy from nothing. But it's these kind of people that are very careful in how they steward their money. But in a way, they're almost uninterested with their wealth. It's like, wow, I can't believe they had this amazing house and this amazing car and this amazing job and they get to take amazing vacations. But they love to give more than they love to receive. So they're like, yeah, it's great, but it's, Jesus is all that matters. Like money doesn't crank their tractor, so God keeps giving them more of it. And he's constantly checking our hearts so that he can check what he can put in our bank accounts. Can we really celebrate other people when they're prospered? And I mean with extreme, when they get vacation homes donated to them, can we really celebrate what God has done? If we will settle the lordship issue, if we will settle our obedience and tithing and generosity, if we will settle our identity that we're not orphans but we're royalty, we're sons and daughters of the Most High God, if we will settle obedience and we'll simply obey and do what he's asked us to do and stop doing the things he's asked us to stop doing, and then we will steward what he's given us well and we won't greed and, and, and pursue and be anxious for more, the people that get this right, God opens the windows of heaven and he pours out a blessing so great that we don't have room to contain it. It's prosperity with a purpose. And that is so that more people can get saved. That the gospel can go to the nations and that we can disciple nations. Hop up on your feet. I want you to repeat the phrase that we said earlier, you know, 30 minutes ago in this message. And maybe with these verses and this, this encouragement in your heart, you won't struggle as much with it. If you believe it, repeat this. Say, I believe, I believe. that God is my loving father. And he wants to prosper me with extreme abundance. Was that a little easier that time? Right? Because those verses remind us that our Father loves us so much that he wants to spoil us rotten. Not literally rotten. He wants to bless us. He wants to pour out his blessing in our life. He wants to, well, Proverbs chapter 10. He wants to make us rich and add no sorrow to it. I said there were five things. We drew them out in little circles and thought bubbles. But there's really only one issue that really matters, and that is the lordship issue. If Jesus isn't Lord over your heart, he'll never be Lord over your finances. If Jesus isn't Lord over your heart, he'll never be Lord over your marriage, your children, your workplace, your hobbies. Jesus really needs to be Lord, that we believe what he says more than what we think. We believe what he says more than what pop culture says. We believe what Jesus says more than anything else in the world. And we're obedient to do what he's called us to do. It's settling the lordship issue in our hearts and in our lives. And as moms and dads, as grandmas and grandpas, we say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Our hearts will serve the Lord. Our finances will serve the Lord. Our children will serve the Lord. Listen, I raised my kids to serve God. I didn't teach them any other way. Well, your, your son's in real estate, but he serves the Lord in real estate. I didn't raise him to work in full-time ministry like his old man. I raised him to serve the Lord. See, sometimes we confuse the difference between the secular and the sacred. When you are royalty, everything you do is royal. You get gas, that's a royal gas pumping. 
You try on a pair of shoes in the shoe store, that is a, a royal thing that happened with those shoes. Everything you touch is royal. When you go to work and you turn on your computer, you drive your truck, you teach your people, you're a police officer, you're a whatever it is, you, when you're a student, everything you do is royal. So you have to erase the line between the secular and the sacred. We've got a couple of people that work in the airline industry. You fly that plane, you serve people as a flight attendant, you, you fix those planes, the mechanics. Dane, I saw you in your uniform somewhere. What you're doing is royal. It's royalty. God favors and blesses everything you do. So don't think about your secular work. You're, everything you do is to serve the Lord. That's establishing the lordship issue. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would forgive us in our limitation of how we think you could bless us. Lord, I, I, I repent and I ask that you would forgive us for thinking too small of your ability to bless. Father, I pray that we as a church family would come into an alignment, into agreement with these five areas in our hearts. Holy Spirit, reveal to us if there's any one or more of these areas that we need to repent and make changes to. If there's some area of lordship, if there's some area of our seeing ourselves as royalty, as, as I, I, identifying as the children of the Most High God, as saints and not sinners, if there's any area in, in how we obey you or we, we stop doing the things that break your heart that you've asked us not to do, if there's any area of obedience and giving and generosity, you are a generous God and I know that you want us to reflect your character and nature and generosity. So Lord, help us to get these five things to sync up. Help us to make you Lord over our minds, our hearts, our marriages, our kids, our grandkids, our, our hobbies, our, our neighborhoods, Lord over the mid-cities. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning or you're watching online and Jesus is not the Lord of your life, maybe you've never made him the Lord of your life, or maybe you've allowed sin into your life and your heart has grown cold and you've wandered away from your faith and you have been out of that lordship issue for many years. Today is your day to get right with God again. I'd like to lead you in a prayer. It's a prayer that'll kill you. I mean, not literally, but it'll, it'll kill what you've been living for so that you can begin to live for, for Jesus. It's a prayer of repentance to ask him to forgive you of your sin. It's a prayer of receiving, that you would receive his love for you and the gift of eternal life. You would receive adoption into the family of God. I'd be happy to lead you in this prayer. It'd be in my highest honor, really. But it has to be your decision. So if you're here this morning or you're watching online and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life or it's been a while and you've allowed your heart to grow cold and you've wandered away from faith, today is your day to come running back to the Father's love. And he's going to bring healing and forgiveness and grace no matter what you've done. So whether it's your first time and your first time in a long time, if you're here this morning and you want to pray and get right with God, would you shoot your hand up real high and just say, preacher, pray for me. Today's my day to get right with you. I see your hands. Is there anybody else? I see your hands. Is there anybody else? Shoot your hand up real high and just say, today's my day to get right with God. Okay, good. Good. Praise God. Hey, what about you that are watching online? I saw two people raise their hand and they're going to get right with God. They're going to repent of their sin and make Jesus the Lord of their life. Today is your day. So right there in your apartment, in your living room, in your car, wherever you're watching this video, if, if God is tugging at your heart, I mean, just shoot your hand up between you and God and just say, Lord, today I want to get right with you. If you believe it in your heart, if you're here in this room and you believe it in your heart, let, let's pray it out loud. Pray like this. Say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. I repent. I surrender my life to you. I receive the gift of adoption as royalty in the kingdom of God. Wash me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness and I receive eternal life. Lord, I pray that you would prosper me with extreme abundance in every area of my life. And if I'm lacking in any one of those five ways, Holy Spirit, reveal it to me. Forgive me. Help me. To settle the Lordship issue over my heart and over my finances. In Jesus' name.
Amen? Hey, I'm so proud of you too, and I'm so proud of you for making Jesus Lord of your life. Yay, God, yay, God, yay, God. Here's what we're gonna do. If you prayed that prayer, if, if, you're, if you're home online or you're here in the room and you prayed that prayer, we wanna help you in your walk of faith. We also wanna screw in a light bulb on the Jesus wall. Every single one of those light bulbs are people that have made Jesus the Lord of their life. Um, so if you're watching online, uh, text the name Jesus to 817-405-2244. It'll send an auto response form. I want you to fill out that form and click submit because we wanna screw in a light bulb for you and we wanna begin to pray for you and encourage you on your walk with God. Speaking of prayer, I'd like our prayer team to come down to the front. If you are here this morning and there's pain in your body, that's not God's will. If there's sickness in your body, that's not God's will. If there's poverty in your body, that's not God's will. If, if there's a decision, a relationship, a thing going on and you just need to take one or two minutes and pray with somebody. These men and women want to pray for you. If you need a prophetic word or word of knowledge, man, we want to pray for you and encourage you. If you gave your heart to Jesus, come on down, man. We want to pray for you and screw in a light bulb for you on the Jesus wall. Everybody else, do business with God. Ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart. There's got to be areas that, that you need to, 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 to get right with God. If you want to get baptized in water, we've got the baptistry over here all plugged in and warm and ready to go. Talk to an usher and we've got black shorts and black t-shirts, you can get baptized today. And we'll leave the old version of you in the water and, and the brand new man of God, woman of God coming out of the water. That's always, that's always available to you. So just grab any usher, any prayer team member, say, I want to get baptized. We're going to quick put some shorts and a t-shirt on you and put you under to your bubble. Make a public declaration of what God's done in your life. Everybody else, let's begin to lift our hearts, lift our hands. Don't think about lunch, don't think about food, don't think about this afternoon. Let's just think about Jesus and, and fix our eyes on him and really give him praise. Come on.